Hey there, folks. Welcome to another fun at-home table read. Tonight we're tackling an odd one, to say the very least. This is the uh, untold origin story of Willy Wonka. I'm not going to go into too much more detail other than that. We're just going to see where this thing goes. Uh, so let's run through with our cast. I'm Angie. I'm reading action. Well, my, my name is Jeremy. And I'm playing Wonka. Thank you. Woo! I'm George. And I'm going to be playing Arthur Slugworth. I'm Tyler, and I'm doing Felix and others. I'm Nisha, and I'm playing Design. I'm Kate, and I'll be Evely and others. I'm Logan, and we'll be reading Hal and a few others. My name is Karina, I'm Lady Gobsmith and a few others. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm reading Sham and a few others. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anne, and I will be Angina Salt. Oh my wonderful god, name. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared. And Grandma, and oh. Grandma Georgina Bucket. I'm so sorry, I wasn't prepared. I know that name. All right, well, I don't think there's a better Anne way to uh, start us off than that. <laughs> Angina's okay. got me on That's the mic. I'm going yeah. on mute. Okay, I'm going All on right, mute. well, I'm going on mute. I'm going Angie, on. take yourself. Oh no, wait, wait. Well, oh my gosh. Yep. Wonka, written by Jason McAuliffe, the imagined life of Willy Wonka, based on the character created by Roald Dahl. Exterior jungle island night, a massive eyeball peers up through a reinforced steel grate buried deep in the jungle ground. Then plop, a bright red berry lands on the grate. Two fingers, about eight inch, about eight feet in length each and covered in thick black fur, poke their way through the grate. The fingers feel the tiny berry, pause, then recoil back into the grate, leaving the berry. Snozberry, not filling enough for a big fella like you, eh? A beat. And then a furious howl. Jungle birds scatter. Loompa Land, 1939. Exterior jungle road night. Torrential rain, a jeep whips through the muddy road. Interior jeep, same. An awful man with a thick scar drives. He peers in the back cargo hold of the Jeep. <laughs> almost there, little fellas, almost there. Through the rear view mirror, three little men are shackled and wearing hoods in the back of the Jeep. Exterior jungle island, cage later. The Jeep pulls up outside the grate. A few other guards are there, each carrying what looks like a large cattle prod. Hard to tell with the rain and the darkness. From inside the jeep, the back door swing open. The awful man with the scar is there. Supper time. The three little men won't budge. Get them out. On the grate, moments later, a small foot steps onto the grate, hesitates, turns back. <laughs> Zap! The sound of an electric cattle prod. So hard to tell what's happening, but whatever it is, it's not good for the little man. The shaking foot takes another step further out into the center of the grate. On the foot, as a blast of hot, steamy breath pours forth from the grate, the little man freaks, turns back, but slips. From above, the little man is face down, straddling the grate, one tiny foot dangling down toward whatever is in there. And then another furious howl. Thump! The little man is yanked along the grate like a rag doll. Side to side, it's horrible, until he disappears into the depths of the earth. A beat, and then an even louder howl. <laughs> Fade to black. Exterior London, 1941, night. The rooftops of London, a Nazi air raid, sirens blare, bombs explode, yet... I first met Willy Wonka in 1941. A silhouette on the rooftops, a line of six teenagers undisturbed by the bombs, each play a different instrument creating a makeshift orchestra. Leading them is a young man, handsome and limber. He's like a 1940s David Bowie. This is William Baniston. You know him better as Willy Wonka. His name was William Baniston back then, but like most things related to Wonka, reality was always up for debate. Willie hops from roof to roof. Their music is encouragingly triumphant, happy. Come on, Tommies. I want to hear, I want those crats to hear us all the way from down here. A bomb explodes closer now, but Willie and his band are undeterred. They keep playing until 
Willie silences his orchestra. He spots a small foot protruding from a chimney cap. He reaches down and pulls out a terrified boy. This is Arthur Slugworth, 15. Lose something down there, lad? Arthur stares up at Willie, mesmerized by the sight. I, I was caught up here when the air raid started. We have to get out of here, sir. Air raid? Do any of you hear an air raid? Willie's band of merrymakers shrugs. Nope, not us. Please help me, sir. We're all in great danger. The explosions are getting closer. Willie leans down, puts an arm around the sooty Arthur. Let me tell you a little secret, mister. Arthur, Mr. Arthur Slugworth, sir. Rather unfortunate name, but I shall tell you my secret nonetheless. Look up there, Sluggy. What do you see? Menacing silver planes swoop above. An air raid. No, you only think you see an air raid. Do you know what I see? Uh, an air raid, sir? I see a flock of the most beautiful silver swans. The German planes magically morph into silver swans. And those swans aren't trying to kill us. They're simply far away members of my orchestra. And as long as I believe that, I'll be safe. Boom. You see, they provided us with a drumbeat. Slugworth, remember this. Reality is whatever we want it to be. Boom. Another massive bomb explodes on the roof next to them. Cut to exterior London Alley moments later. Willie, Arthur, and the band of merrymakers, dazed, lay in a pile of sooty trash. Obviously, I meant that in the more metaphorical sense. Arthur looks at Willie. Who is this guy? Willie hands Arthur a tambourine. Willie then motions to his band. Their instruments are all mangled, but no problem. Row on, my soldiers, for there's no earthly way of knowing which direction they are going. There's no knowing where we are rowing or which way the river's flowing. Oh, I know the song. <laughs> Willie and his band play off key into the night. Arthur hesitates, then runs after them. Wonka. Exterior. Theater? The, what? TV? Ah, there we go. Exterior TV toothpaste factory day. A toothpaste factory. Interior TV toothpaste factory, same. An assembly line. Willie and Arthur, dressed in factory uniforms, screw caps on tubes of toothpaste. A few of the merrymakers are on the line too, specifically Devin, 17, red hair, flamboyant. Fairly self-explanatory, cap, tube, screw. Repeat until you have no uh, will to live. The foreman sneers at Willie. Why aren't you two in the army? Not old enough. And they don't take poofs like me. Willie squirts a bit of toothpaste at Devin. You wish, Willie. That is what I wish for. Across the factory floor types a team of secretaries. They all wear beige suits, except for one who wears all black. This is Evelie Gobsmith, 19, the most beautiful girl in London. Good luck. Evelie Gobsmith, she's in mourning. Fiance died in the Battle of Malta. Almost a year ago, which means her mourning shall end any day now. Evelie looks straight at Willie, then away. Her fiance was Hal, Hal Bucket. The bell rings, work is done. Willie hops up and races off, leaving Arthur and Devin. Bucket's Chocolate, the richest family in London? She was engaged to a bucket and now Willie thinks she'd be into a poor chap like him? Reality is whatever we want it to be. Do you really think that's true? Yes, but unlike Willie, I don't think it's always a good thing, my boy Sluggy. Arthur and Devin pack up for the day. Exterior London streets, night. Cold and gray as the factory workers file out and head home. Willie runs up behind Evely and assumes a normal pace as to seem cool. It's a shame you'll never know the joy of being courted by me. Evely gives Willie the side eye, keeps walking. I'm sure you were just about to ask why. Fine, if you must know, it's because I don't believe in love. Evely turns the corner. They're entering a fancier part of town. Still bleak though. But if I did believe in love, I, on account of my free spirit and infinite imagination, suppose would be quite the lover. Evely stops. That's so. They've reached a fancy townhouse. 
<laughs> so you are interested. Well, I'm sorry, but I have to decline. And if perchance at the stroke of midnight you were to sneak out of your bedroom window, shimmy down that lattice and meet me by the boat dock in Hyde Park, I certainly will not be there to meet you. Master William Bannison, as you can see, I am still in mourning. And as you surely know, a woman in mourning cannot possibly court. And though I think the morning rules to be outdated, I'd certainly never break them for a dandy as floppish as you. A woman, Lady Josephine Gobsmith, Evelie's stern mother, opens the door to Evelie's townhouse and hustles Evelie inside. She said yes. He skips off. Exterior, Willy Wonka's house, night. A skinny house wedged in between two larger but equally shitty homes. Interior, Willy Wonka's house, night. A man and woman, Wonka's mum mum and pop, sit listening to the war radio. Willie tries to sneak past them. William, how was the toothpaste business today? Is that Same, as the, same as every day, Pop. That's That's nice. There's a cabbage soup on the stove for you, William. Willie leans down and kisses his mom. My special recipe, cabbage and water. Sounds delicious, Mom. The secret's in the cabbage and the water. <laughs> Willie heads into the kitchen, looks at the disgusting cabbage soup, sighs, ladles a boil, bowl and tries to eat it. Interior gobsmith house, same. Evelie sits on an uncomfortable sofa while Lady Gobsmith paces. She's less like a charming, she's, she's like a less charming Snape from Harry Potter. You are in mourning. He's dead, mother. And the plan is to find another. The money is almost gone, Evelyn. And whose fault is that? Sorry, I lost my spot. Your father's put us in this position, not me. Lady Gobsmith motions toward Lord Joseph Gobsmith, passed out drunk in a recliner, and then to a mounted head of a nasty beast above the fireplace. What a fool tries to make it in the hornswagger trade. Hornwaggers aren't even real. A boar with the stone on Rhino's horn. Father's a good man, aren't you, Father? Lord Gobsmith awakens for a moment and passes out again. A pension for the drink and a tendency for idiocity is unfortunately all you inherit if you keep running around with louts. I'm sorry your scheme to whore your daughter out to the richest family in London didn't work out as planned. Lady Gobsmith takes a deep breath. You will find a suitable husband and you will do without complaint and with the utmost graciousness. Evelie races upstairs. You will not speak to that uh, oddity again. Have I made myself clear? I have no interest in a disgusting rogue like William Banniston. All the well then as it is forbidden. Evelie stops, cocks her eyebrow. Forbidden? Of course, mother. Evelie heads to her room. Exterior, gobsmith house, night. Evelie climbs out onto, on the top window and shimmies down the side of the lattice. Exterior, Hyde Park, lake, after midnight. Evelie waits on a dock by the shores of a large lake in the middle of the park. She looks up at a clock, 12.05. Later, 12.10, Evelie looks around, worried. Later, 12.15, Evelie is pissed, but then, in true willy fashion, in the distance, across the water, six pink Viking-shaped paddle boats heading toward the shore. Willie is in one, his merrymakers, now including Arthur, in the others. Music plays and sparklers light up the water. You made it! Is it always your policy to keep a girl waiting? Am I late? It's a quarter past. My watch must have stopped. You're not wearing a watch. Sure I am. You're just not seeing it. It's an invisible watch. An invisible watch? And it doesn't tell time. It only points me in the direction of the most interesting girl within 50 links. Well then, I see it works perfectly. Devin, on the next boat, looks to Arthur. I think Willie has finally met his match. Wonka extends his hand to help Evelie onto the boat, motions for his band to play. Exterior, Hyde Park, Lake, Later. Willie and Evelie paddle towards a small island in the center of the lake. He motions for his friends to fall back. So, tell me about yourself. You'll have to do better than that, Mr. William Banniston. 
all the same, there is no self anyway. I mean, who's to say if any of us even exist? I've been to school, Willie. Mental gymnastics do not impress me. Willie paddles the boat up onto the island. He hops up and offers Evelie a hand. Then maybe this will. Exterior Hyde Park Lake, Island Gazebo, later. A small table is set in the middle of the gazebo. The merrymakers stand a few feet away, some playing music, some holding sparklers. And will there be actual food at this picnic? It's right there in front of you. The plate is empty. Evelie shoots Wonka a look. Fine. Willie gets up, rustles through the bushes, returns, and places one blueberry on each plate. A blueberry? A blueberry? You hurt my heart, Evelie. I have gone to great expense to prepare you a three-course meal of turtle soup, the finest roast pheasant, and for dessert, the sweetest of puddings. Evelie looks down on her blueberry, picks it up, puts it in her mouth. Willie studies her. The soup needs salt. Willie smiles. Interior TV toothpaste factory, day one. The bell rings. Willie hops up, races out. Exterior London streets moments later, Willie races up to Evelie, no longer in morning black, and hands her a small golden box that reads, H.R.H. Bucket's Fine Chocolatiers since 1853. Evelie looks at the box, keeps walking. The chocolate is terrible. Willie stops as Evelie heads home, opens the box, tastes the chocolate, bitter. Interior tea, tea the toothpaste factory, day two. The bell rings again, Willie races out. Exterior London streets, moments later. Willie approaches Evelie in the same spot, hands her a dozen red roses. One dozen, cost me a week's pay. Any man can think of roses. Evelie walks off, smiling coyly at Willie. Willie looks at the roses. Interior TV toothpaste factory, day three. Another bell. Willie hops up. Devin looks to Arthur. Exterior London streets, moments later. Willie approaches Evelie again, this time with nothing. He bows before her and hands her an invisible teacup. Tea. I'd love some. Willie reaches his pocket and pulls out a non-existent teapot and pours Evelie a cup of tea. And? This is the most delicious cup of tea I have ever tasted. Willie offers Evelie his arm. She pretends to finish the tea, puts down the fake cup, and takes his arm. As they pass, a newspaper boy holds a paper that reads, War over! Allies defeat! Nazi menace! Exterior Park Day, a few weeks later. Evelie sits on a bench reading a book. Willie approaches, hops up on top of the bench behind her. Poetry? I hate poetry. You? I hardly believe that. Willie grabs the book from her, sits down next to her. Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. I'm falling asleep already. Just read it to me, please. <sighs> Yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. You're reading it backwards, Willie. A good poem can be read in any order one chooses. Now, if you don't mind. World losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams. Evelie looks at Willie and smiles. They read together. We are, we are the, music the music makers, makers and, and we, we are, are the dreamers, the dreamers of dreams. dreams. Willie leans in for a kiss. Evelie blushes, turns away, then returns and accepts Willie's kiss. As they kiss, fireworks explode behind them. A few boys run past them in the park, then more, then more. What's the ruckus? Haven't you heard our boys are back? Evelie and Willie hop up and follow the crowd to exterior London streets, parade, same. A jubilant parade, soldiers kiss their old flames, mothers hug their sons. Willie notices something strange fall over Evelie's face. She drops his hand, almost in a trance. How? On Willie, as he watches Evelie walk forward through the parting crowd, parting to reveal a handsome soldier tall and square-jawed. He removes his hat. This is Hal Bucket, 24, Evelie's fiance. Hal and Evelie embrace. You're alive. Long story, my dear, long story. But first... Uh... Willie approaches. Hal spots him, then kisses Evelie. Oh, um, 
how this is William Banniston. William, this is Hal Bucket, my fiance. Banniston? Oh, your father works for my father at the factory, eh? Cleans the loo, I believe. Well, William, when I take over, his job is yours. You have my word as a gentleman. Now, I am famished, and if I know my mother, she'll have a feast ready for us. Hal looks to Willie slyly. He knows something's up. Join us, won't you, Willie? Oh. I insist. I think Willie has to. Uh, gladly. Uh, gladly. Ex- exterior gobsmith house, dusk. Willie races after Evelie. She's crying. Willie pauses. Do you love him? I said, do you love him? Of course not. My mother loves his money. Then tell him. We'll tell them. We'll tell them all tonight at dinner. Tell them what? Willie pulls out a rumpled piece of butterscotch candy. That I intend to marry you. Willie. Now, since this is rather rushed, I only had time to procure this quite rare butterscotch diamond. The queen herself owns two. Willie? Hers are slightly small. Willie gets down on one knee. Emily Gobsmith, mm, yum, Lou. That's will you marry me backwards. You didn't expect me to propose properly, did you? I would expect nothing less. So? Yes, yes, I'll marry you, Willie. They kiss, Willie spins her around. Above, Lady Gobsmith eavesdropping angrily closes the lace curtains. Exterior, the bucket estate, night. The grand gates, sporting a giant cursive B, open as a line of cars head down the long tree-lined driveway. Interior, the bucket estate, night. A grand estate right in the center of town, a line of servants greet Evely, <clears throat> the very elated Lady Gobsmith and a very confused Lord Gobsmith. Willie enters behind them. He approaches Evely and grasps her hand. Lady Gobsmith smacks it off. Is he here? Fighted by Hal. Lady Gobsmith sours until a stern couple descend the grand staircase. This is George and Georgina Bucket, the wealthiest family in London. George, Georgina! Lord Joseph and Lady Josephina, always a delight. Georgie, how are you? How's your chocolate business treating you? Good, I'd say. Lady Gobsmith is mortified. What a joyous occasion, Hal. Alive and a war heel at that. You must be beside yourself with a twiddling twingle. Oddly, the buckets are not that thrilled. And of course, our Emily house fiance, you remember, has been practically prostrate with grief this whole time. Poor thing. Emily nods. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket? And who is this interestingly dressed fellow? No one. This is William Banniston. Lord Gobsmith's ballet. Willie and Evelie fume. Well, I do hope you'll be joining us for dinner, William. Wouldn't miss it for all the cocoa and Lumba land. Lady Gobsmith can barely control her anger. Dining room later. Downton style, a line of servants, including a very pretty maid, Elsa, 19, attend to the bucket's every need. See, that's when the third bomb hit. It didn't explode, at least not yet. It just rolled along the deck, landing right at my feet. I looked at my crew, these men I loved, and I said to myself, Hal, you gotta die for your crew, you gotta die for the men on the ground. Lady Gobsmith wipes away a tear. So I picked up the bomb and dove into the Mediterranean. <clears throat> Sharks everywhere. Such bravery! And then, the next thing I knew, I was on the shores of Tunisia. Made my way through the burning desert, fighting off the occasional horn swaggler along the way. Uh, Finally making it to Marrakesh, where I learned my dear mother and father thought I was pronounced dead. Elsa, the maid, cleared Hal's plate. He sneaks his hand up her dress and pats her ass. Enough about me, I'm just happy to be back. Alive, healthy, and with the woman I love. Hal leans over and kisses Evelie. Lady Gobsmith is elated. Willie, fuming, stands up. William, do you have a toast? I do not, sir, but I believe my dear friend Evelie does. Evelie is trembling in fear, but stands Uh, up. uh, To my beloved fiancé, Hal. 
Let us toast to your miraculous return. The table toasts. Willie storms out. The men all stand. Willie. Probably just a bit too much drink. I'll take care of this. Hal exits in uncomfortable silence. Georgina, wherever did you get such a beautiful cuttery? Interior, the bucket estate, hallway, same. Willie races furiously through an ornate hallway filled with doors. From his perspective, the doors start to morph and elongate, becoming all twisted and wonky. He passes a portrait of Hal and punches it with his fist. But at the end of the hallway suddenly stands Hal. I know you're just a Luke Cleaner's son, but you must know it's impolite to create a scene. Willie tries to move past him, but the much bigger Hal grabs his wrist. Come, let's have a chat. Hal pulls Willie into the big game room. Same. Guns line the wall. Mounted beasts loom. She doesn't love you. Hal opens a small glass box and removes a pistol. I know. And quite frankly, the feeling is mutual. Elsa enters with two glasses of scotch. Honestly, I prefer a more uh, formidable woman myself. But as it were, my family is very wealthy and her family has a title and so on and so forth and blah, blah, blah. You can have any woman in London. I can. And I do. And when I marry Evelyn, I will be the first person in my family to have a title, William. I'm sure you can understand how having a title will make my parents so very proud of me. Willie looks around at the beasts. There are no horned swagglers in Tunisia. I'm sorry? Your story. You said you fought off horn swagglers in the desert. Horn swagglers are jungle beasts. Willie stands up. You did not save your crew, did you? You jumped ship at the first sign of danger. You are a coward, Hal. Bucket, a fraud. Listen to me, you freak. You know nothing about what happened down there. I know you're lying. And I intend to tell everyone. Willie exits. Hal looks at his pistol angrily, but puts it back in its case. Hal turns to Elsa. Be in my chamber in an hour. Elsa looks down and then exits. And where would I bought you this time? Exterior Willy Wonka's house, night. Willy sits on his roof, the gray nights of London closing in on him. Below, running along the cor- cobblestones, Evelie. Willy! She pounds on the door, no answer. Willy, I'm sorry, I didn't know what to do. Still no answer. Willy? Willy looks down from the roof, then coldly, with a flip of his flowing overcoat, turns the other way. Interior, the bucket estate, hallway, night. Hal zips up his pants as he shuffles Elsa out of his bedroom and into the hallway. She's not thrilled with what she has to do for him. And Elsa? She turns back. Hal picks up a decorative cane off the wall. It has a brass handle. Come here, my sweet. She approaches tentatively. One last thing. I need to go to the police right now. I'm sorry? Go to the police immediately and tell them Mr. William Banniston did this to you. Did what to me, sir? Hal smacks Elsa across the face with the cane. Then again in the eye, she doubles over in pain. Go now. Elsa looks up at him. Monster. I said go! Elsa runs down the hallway. Exterior London streets, night. Elsa, afraid and in pain, races toward the police building. Fade out. Exterior, TV toothpaste factory, the next day. Willie, Devin, Arthur, and some other merrymakers exit the factory as the bell sounds. Evely follows quickly behind. Willie! Willie looks to his crew, keeps walking. Willie, please talk to me. You hear anything? Nothing. I could have sworn I heard the groveling sounds of guilt. Sounded more like the shrieks of shame to me. They keep walking. Willie, please. Maybe you should hear her out. There could be an explanation. Willie stops, looks Arthur square in the eye. He's almost terrifying. Mad. The first brick in the Wonka we know. We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. 
I don't understand, Willie. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample an entire an, an empire down. Willie walks off. Evely, chilled, stays put. Exterior, mm-hmm. London Street, same. Bombs couldn't distract Willie as he walks. Interior, Willie Wonka's house, same. Willie enters, slams the door behind him. He stops cold. His pop is crying. Pop's been fired. In the distance, police sirens. 43 years, I've cleaned the loo with the buckets. 43 years. 43 years, Willie. Never missed a day, never missed a spot. I don't, I don't know what I've done wrong. Furious, Willie throws back on his coat, spots his dad Kane with a thick brass handle, picks it up. He smacks it against his hand, then heads right back out the front door. Willie? He's gone. Exterior, Willie Wonka's house, same. Willie exits just as a swarm of police tackle him. What? Is this the man? He turns to Elsa. She nods, then looks away in shame. Another policeman picks up the cane. Hmm. Then nods to the constable. What, uh, what have I done? Get in the car. I have done nothing wrong. Shackled, they push Willie into a waiting police car. The sirens blare. Willie's mom races out of the house. William! But I have done nothing wrong. Interior Old Bailey Criminal Court, London, day. A judge leers an unmoved Willie. Behind Willie are his sobbing parents. Also in attendance are the Buckets, Lord and Lady Gobsmith, Elsa and Hal. No, Evely. Will the defendants please rise? Willie stands up. Are you ready to receive the news of your fate? The suspense is terrible. I hope it lasts. You! William Bannison, for the crime of indecent assault <laughs> upon a lady, shall be sentenced to up to ten years of hard labor in the dark colonies. A gavel pounds. Willie's mum collapses. The gobsmiths seem thrilled. Two bailiffs grab Willie and shackle him. Remove him! The bailiffs throw Willie out, too. Exterior Old Bailey Criminal Court, London, moments later. Willie is shoved into the waiting paddy wagon. Devin, Arthur, and the rest of the merrymakers are there. Boo! Boo to the swine of London! Boo! 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 Arthur runs up to the paddy wagon, concerned. Willie! Promise you'll write, Sluggy. A lot will happen in ten years, and I expect you to keep me abreast. What are you going to do, Willie? I don't think reality is whatever you want it to be in a forced labor camp. I have something else that will get me through. What's that? The paddy wagon starts up. We move in on Willie. He's different. More determined. Revenge, Sluggy. I will have revenge on the buckets. I will make them pay. I will make their children pay. I'll make their children's children pay. And I will make all of London pay for what they have done to my broken heart. The paddy wagon tears off into the bustling London streets. Exterior Isle of Dogs, London, night. Pouring rain, a bustling shipyard. Willie is manhandled onto an ominous looking ship. Interior prison ship, moments later. Willie is marched by two guards in a long hallway along the bottom of the ship's hull. Above him, lines of prison cells filled with vile characters. Interior prison ship, cell, same. Willie is tossed inside, nothing but hay in a small round window. Two very creepy men are across from him. One is short and stout, and one is tall and lanky. Meet Prodnose and Fickle Grubber. Prodnose stares at Willie, then looks at Fickle Grubber, then lights a match in the darkness. Welcome. Fickle Grubber and Pro- Prodnose begin to laugh. Exterior, prison ship, same. The engines start up. Dock boys release the hitches and push away from the dock. Behind them, a car races up. Evely gets out and runs toward the edge of the dock. Willie! Willie! The ship pushes away. Interior prison ship, same. Prodnose is at the window, looks to Willie. 
Hey, Fickle Gwerper, looks like his sweetheart is here. She looks like a fine sweetheart to me, isn't it right, Prod Nose? Through a porthole window, Evely is distraught, searching for Willie. Who is she? Willie gets up, peers through the window. Now what? Through the porthole, a crying Evely gets smaller and smaller as the ship sails down to the Thames. An exterior Atlantic Ocean, a few days later, night. The prison ship steams through the rough seas. Dear Sluggy, I'm very much enjoying my time on what has turned out to be a luxury cruise ship with passengers of the highest quality. Interior prison ship cell, same. Prod nose is doubled over in the corner, vomiting. For Christ's sakes, will you quit it, you wanker? Prod nose vomits again. <laughs> Willie Wonka, Willie walks over to him. Here you go. Willie it holds out an empty palm. Go ahead. There ain't nothing there. Yeah, your hand's empty. You only think it's empty. But this, my friends, is a Singapore sea sickness pill. Size small. Why you always talk like that? Go ahead. Prod nose, beyond sick, reaches into Willie's palm and picks up the pill. Takes it. Usually it begins working in just a few seconds. Fickle Grubber stands up. He's huge. You stop talking that mess, boy. I know not of what you speak, Mr. Fickle Gruber. I'm merely trying to help my friend, my dear friend, uh, Mr. Prodnos. Hey, it's working. I feel better. That's impossible. I feel, really feel better. Look. Prodnos stands up. Fickle Grubber looks to Willie. Who are you? William Baniston. I work at the Teethy Toothpaste Factory. Who are you really? A magician or something? You went to dark arts, ain't you? A devil worshiper. Behind his back, Fickle Grubber purrs, pulls out a shiny knife. I'm just a young man enjoying a beautiful cruise with new friends. Fickle Grubber holds out the knife to Willie's neck. Listen here, you little punk. You got a lot of nerve coming in here with your wonky magic and your wonky clothes and you're talking all wonky rhymes. Let's all calm down now. Willie looks out the porthole. A big wave is coming. Shut up, you fat wanker. Now, if I hear one more weird or crazy or sing-songy thing <sighs> that little mouth of yours, I'm gonna, bam, the wave hits. Fickle Grubber falls. Willie grabs the knife. Mr. Fickle Gruber, Gruber, our mutual bunkmate, Mr. Prodnos and I have another 13 days on the ship with you. And while I do find your honesty refreshing, as I must say, it is very un-British. Still, we would appreciate a little decorum for the rest of the trip. Fickle Grubber is madder than ever. He approaches Willie. Decorum? I said no weird words. I'm going to rip your throat out. Then bam, another big wave. Fickle Grubber stumbles and falls forward onto the knife in Willie's hand. Fickle Grubber drops to the ground. <gasps> Wonky bastard! Fickle Grubber dies. Willie looks to Prodnose in fear. He's dead. He fell onto the knife. And you killed him. No. No, I would never kill anyone. You're not just some guy who beat up a lassie, are you? You're a murderer. You saw for yourself. He fell. It's okay, mate. I won't tell so. It was an accident. We all tell ourselves whatever gets us through the night, don't we, Wonky? I promise. I, I didn't mean to. Sure you meant to, but like I said, your secret is safe with me. All bad apples deserve to die, ain't it white, Wonky? No! No one deserves to die. Let me make it a little deal. My murdering friend, you give me all the cash you got in that sack of yours and mine will tell a soul. But I did nothing wrong. Murder! Shh! Don't come! Murder! Stop, stop saying that! Murder! Stop it! Murder! Willie looks around, picks up his pillow, shoves it over Prodnose's face. Prodnose still shut screams. Up. Shut up! Shut up! Prodnose twitches, fights back, twitches again, stops fighting, then dies. We move in on Willie. Like in the hallway at the Bucket Estate, the walls start to become all twisty and turny. What have I done? Nothing! I've done nothing! We move in on Willie's face. All bad apples deserve to die. 
Willie smiles. Later, a guard walks by and looks in Willie's cell. Looks like Prodnose and Fickle Grubber are asleep. The guard passes on. Willie then hops up and gets to work. Later, Willie shoves Fickle Grubber's long and lanky body through the porthole window. Exterior prison ship, same. Splash! Fickle Grubber's body falls into the turbulent sea. And so, Sluggy, while I have made wonderful new friends. Interior prison ship, cell, same. Willie pushes Prodnose's chubby body as hard as he can to the porthole window. Stuck. The guard's footsteps approach. Willie pushes again. And again, until finally, exterior prison ship, same. Prodnose's body falls into the sea, followed by the knife. It's always sad to see them go. Your friend, Willie. Interior prison ship, cell, same. Willie begins to yell. Ah, guard! Guard! Guard races over. Willie points to the open window. Exterior prison ship, same. Four guards hang over the railing. Serves him right. Two bodies bob in the distance. Exterior prison ship, 13 days later. The ship approaches the same jungle island from the opening. Exterior jungle island, docks, same. Willie steps out onto a dock holding an apple, a bright, almost technicolor island. All manners of trees no one has ever seen before begin rustling. A small work camp is near the shore. Up the airy mountain, down the rushing glen, we dare not go a hunting for fear of little men. Then, the same furious howl we heard earlier. Willie smiles, takes a bite of his apple. Exterior prison work camp, day. A line of prisoners are proceeding in by the guards. Willie approaches the table. Nay. Fickle Gruber. Proud nose, Fickle Gruber. The work camp guard looks at his passenger manifest. See, in for hmm, uh, murder. I want to get you down twice. See here, Proud nose, then uh, Fickle Gruber. Ooh, double murder, I see. And we, I mean, I, sh I shall gladly pay for my crimes. And <laughs> you will, my boy. Yeah, you will. Another work camp guard shoves Willie inside the camp. Later, the work camp guards compare their passenger manifests. Dearest Mr. and Mrs. W. Baniston, it is with deep regret. Interior Willy Wonka's house, night. Willie's mom and pop read an official. And heartfelt condolences that we inform you of the passing of your son, William, on the prison ship, Cataluna. Willie's mom clutches Pop's hand. Exterior, Hyde Park, Lake, Night, a makeshift funeral, all the merrymakers in black, just a silhouette, Arthur too. Your son had no items of value upon his person, so therefore we have enclosed none of his belongings. He was buried at sea. Have a lovely day. Arthur crumples up the letter. The band begins to play. Exterior prison work camp, a few months later. A vast orchard of cocoa trees surrounded by high walls topped with barbed wire fences. At various points along the wall, armed snipers pace. Willie, now with a beard and a beaten down look, works the fields, removing cocoa pods with fellow prisoners. An evil looking dude, seven feet tall with a scar running from his ear to left eyeball, cracks a whip. This is Sham, the prisoner, prisoner foreman with anger issues, the awful man from the opening. Can you hear you guys? Uh -huh. Faster, you bundles of rubbish. Human rubbish. That's what you are. Rubbish. Willie looks up to the snipers, then to a fellow prisoner. I guess there's, uh, there's no escaping. The prisoner looks to Sham and makes sure he's not looking. This is Felix, 20s, slim, and shy. The snipers aren't for us. They're for the Wang Doodles. Wang Doodles are real? I was mostly, but they do love their cocoa. The ones you really need to watch out for are the horse wagons and the snot wagons. 
Next, I suppose you'll warn me of the vermicious nid. Felix looks to Willie. Shh, but it's too late. Sham is there. What did you say? Nothing, sir. You making fun of my face? <laughs> no, no, sir, not at all. Let me tell you something. If a pansy like yourself come face to face with a vermacious nid like I did, you'd be in for more than a scar, Mr. Prod Nose Finkel Grubber. I'm sorry, sir. Mm-hmm. Find me at the final whistle. I got a special task for you. Sheffy needs snozberries. They're the governor's favorite, and I think you're just the passy to go out and forge them. <laughs> Sham begins to laugh. So do the other prisoners. <laughs> Get to work, wankers! Later, dusk. The sun has set over the jungle. It's ominous. Horrid sounds come from the towering trees that surround the camp. Wang doodles? Snoz wangers? Or worse? Willie whispers to Felix as they shimmy into a tree to get more cocoa pods. Here's what you do. Go straight along the stream to that hill over there. That's where the snodberry grow. If a snodwinger attacks, you toss him a snodberry. Put him in a state bliss for hours. They live for snodberries, but snodberries grow too high for them to reach. Okay. Toss the snozwingers a snozberry. That's if you get past your horse wagons. What do I do about them? Run! And what about the wang doodles? Duck. And the vermicious nid? Pray. And the oompa loompas? <laughs> Just a mate. Billy is like, great. He shims, shimmies down the tree. Right hey! I was afraid too. Really? How did you know my name? I work for the buckets. Down. I work for the buckets once. Still am, really. We all are now. All these beads go to the buckets. Free labor. I know you didn't do it. I know how. I know what he's capable of. And what about you? Same boat, but not by the buckets. I'm a clockmaker by trade. I got an apprenticeship in Germany to study under what I thought was a great master. Interior clockmaker's shop, Germany, the past. But turns out he was a fraud, evil man, fat as the mad horn, <laughs> like an overstuffed bratwurst. He saw my design. It was a watch that let out a soft ping exactly ten years before the wearer of the watch was to die. To the minute, accurate 99.9% .9 of the time, I put all my effort into it. I thought, what a gift to know the date of your demise. Of one could live life to the fullest, but this German had a newborn son. One day his baby obese little thing crawled into the shop and picked up my watch. And it pinged! It pinged in the hands of a newborn! The German flew out of rage. I told him I'm sorry, but the watch does not lie. Furious, he convinced the police. I stole a bunch of his family's pride clocks. Cuckoo clocks! And the law believed them. They always believed the rich guys. And so I ended up here. Back to prison camp. And what was this swine's name? Gloop. Augustus Gloop Senior. And I'll get my revenge. Willie nods as the final whistle sounds. Good luck. Willie gulps. Exterior prison work camp, night. Sham hands Willie a pocket watch. You got two hours. Sham and Sheffy, the camp chef, wave goodbye as Willie, as he lets out of the camp and heads off into the jungle. They both laugh hysterically. Exterior jungle night. Willie, holding a satchel, follows along a stream. All kinds of terrible noises come from all directions. He pulls out the walk pocket watch. 1.45 left. He hops over a stone into the stream. Swoop! He looks up. What was that? Then another swoop. He stops, looks around. Several beady green eyes in the trees. Wang doodle. A wang doodle flutters down into the, onto a stone in the stream in front of him. It looks like an owl with the face of a raccoon. 
You're adorable. Wangdoodle lets out a hideous squeal, revealing its sharp fangs. Or not. Willie reaches in his pocket and pulls out a cocoa bean, tosses it. The wangdoodle grabs it and flies away. Okay. Wangdoodle, problem solved. But then, 20 more wangdoodles descend from the trees. Oh. No more cocoa beans, guys. Uh, perhaps you could try some leaves. Uh, plenty of leaves around. The 20 wangdoodles squeal. It's terrifying. Exterior prison work camp, same. Sham and Sheffy hear the squeal. <laughs> Guess the governor won't be getting his snozberries tonight. <laughs> they both laugh. Exterior jungle, same. Okay, you don't like leaves. Then I'll just be on my way and you all can dine on whatever. And just like that, the wangdoodles scatter. Well then. Then behind him, the sound of a pig snort. <laughs> Willie feels hot breath on the back of his neck. Willie moves forward slowly to the other side of the stream, turns around. A giant boar-like creature with red fur and a pig's snout. Snozwanger. Willie starts running as fast as he can. The snozwanger takes off after him. It's hard to tell what's going on as Willie is moving so fast through the jungle, but he hops over a log. So does the snozwanger. Then a boulder. Snozwanger still there. Then up ahead, a steep rock. Above it are the famed snozberry bushes, bright red fruit glistening. Willie throws himself onto the rock face, barely hanging on. The snozwanger bearing its incisors is right below him. Willie gets a leg up just in time. The snozwanger runs back, turns, charges. He's going to jump. Willie stretches as far and long as he can. A snozberry dangles above him. The snozwanger jumps. Willie grasps the snozberry and tosses it into the snozwanger's open mouth. The snozwanger collapses to the ground in a state of snozberry bliss. Willie looks up the bush, grabs his satchel, and fills it with snozberries. He hops down and pets the blissful snozwanger. He then pops a snozberry in his own mouth. Get it. Willie takes off. Exterior jungle, night. Willie's lost. The stream has forked. He takes the wrong fork. Later, Willie looks at his watch. 55 minutes left. He's reached the clearing. The moon is bright. From across the clearing, another terrible beast. This one looks like a rhino, but furry and with a massive horn. It's a horn swoggler. And it's about to eat a little man. This is Narmf, an Oompa Loompa. He's not orange with the green hair. He's short yet muscular with tan skin and Southeast Asian features. His face is painted with orange and green tribal markings. Willie jumps into action. Horn swaggler, you little horn swaggler. The horn swaggler rears his head around, terror. Over here, my giant, terrifying beast. The horn swaggler leaves Narf and charges at Willie. Well, a uh, little nonsense now and then is relished by the wisest men. The horn swaggler is closer. Willie digs into his bag. Snowsberry. Narf. Narfa covers his face with his hands. Ugh. Horn swaggler is 10 feet away until thump. He lands on his stomach, sliding right along next to Willie's feet. An arrow is in his back. Narumph walks up, lowers his archery bow, and bows, points to his chest. Nar Narpa! Willie. Willie! Narpa then puts out a huge machete from his arrow bag. We did just meet, Narpa. Narpa chomps off the horn slogger's horn. He bows and Glumflexion picks up the horn and hands it to Willie. He motions for Willie to follow him. Exterior jungle, night. Willie, far Willie follows Narpa through the thickest jungle, yet until they come to a small cave. Narpa reaches into his bag and lights a torch. Interior jungle cave, same. Narpa uses his torch to illuminate a series of exquisite cave paintings. Willie is amazed. A great try. Narpa nods. That's you? Oompa Loompa! So you are real. Narpa is like, duh. So uh, a great tribe lived in peace, uh, eating from the trees, the cocoa trees. Uh, they are very happy until the giant men came. Oh, that, that, would, be, that would be me. Narpa nods. I, I mean, 
not me personally. I'm not. I'm on your side here, as, as I too have always been a bit of an outcast. Now I put motions for Willie to speed it up. So moving on, uh, the giant men force the Oompa Loompas deeper into the jungle where the beasts live. Uh, that's a horn swaggler and a snozzwagger. The giant men stole the trees. You mean the cocoa? Harpa nods. And then the giant men kidnapped the Oompa Loompas and fed them to the giant beasts in the ground, the vernicious nid. Harpa nods. I'm sorry. Harpa motions for Willie to keep reading. But one day, another giant man with blue eyes came from the sea and saved the Oompa Loompa. Narpa points to Willie. Narpa then bows again. <laughs> oh, 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 no. No, there must be some mistake. I am no hero. He points to the horn swaggler's horn. Narpa makes a grinding gesture. Grind? Narpa nods. He then reaches into his palm and pretends to toss dust into the air. He then makes a choking gesture and then falls to the ground. Poison? Narpa nods. He then opens his palm, pulls out a leaf, unfolds it, revealing a small piece of chocolate. Willie takes it. Narpa nods. Go ahead, eat it. Willie takes a bite. We move in on his face. He smiles and closes his eyes. It truly is the best piece of chocolate ever. You must show me how you make this. Narpa takes back the leaf, then points to the horn, then another grinding gesture, then points to the drawing of the giant men. Revenge! You want revenge on the giant men? Narpa nods. Then like that, he's gone. We all do, my little friend. We all do. Willie smiles, still in bliss from the chocolate, then looks to his watch. Two minutes left. Interior prison work camp, kitchen, moments later. Willie tosses his satchel of snozberries on the countertop. Sheffy and Sam look at each other, impressed. On his way out, Willie snags the mortar and pestle. Exterior prison work camp, day. Willie walks past a line of prisoners shoveling cocoa beans from a giant silo and then into burlap sacks. Each sack is printed with the word HRH buckets. Exterior prison work camp, fields, dusk. Willie and Felix collect beans. Willie nods to Felix. Felix nods back. Exterior prison work camp, trash incinerator, night a terrible incinerator. Willie and Felix toss, toss bags of trash inside, look around to make sure the coast is clear and peer behind the billowing incinerator. Two piles, each wrapped in giant leaves. Inside of each one is a new horn swaggler horn. Willie and Felix snag them. Interior prison work camp, Willie and Felix's cell, same. Felix removes a small cinder block from behind his bed, pulls out a bag and pours horn swaggler powder inside. The lights go out for the night. Willie unfolds the other leaf. Inside are two Loompa chocolates and a drawing, the recipe. Willie tosses one to Felix and then eats the other. How could something so small be so good? Willie lays on his bunk and eats the chocolate. It's like the pure love in candy form. But with no bitter aftermath. Felix looks to Willie. Willie closes his eyes. Exterior prison work camp, dawn. Willie and Felix dump the entire bag of horn swaggler powder into the silo. Inside silo, a metal arm mixes the cocoa beans, now coating each one with the poison powder. Exterior prison work camp, time lapse. Prisoners load beans into more bags marked HRH buckets. The bags are loaded into the prison ship. Bag after bag, day after day, ship after ship. Exterior Bucket Chocolate Boutique, London, day. A wealthy woman with a giant bouffant and walking two corgis exit the shop with a beautiful package. She takes a seat on the bench and opens it, revealing a beautiful chocolate truffle. She takes a bite, bitter. She then begins to clutch her throat. Foam pours from her mouth. Passerby stops, dear God. The wealthy woman screams and then keels over dead her bouffant landing next to the empty package of chocolate, her dog lips her foamy mouth. Exterior prison work camp, trash incinerator, night. Willie and Felix find more horns from Nar, 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 Narpa. Exterior prison work camp, day. More HRH bucket sacks loaded onto the ship. Exterior cathedral, day. All done up for a wedding. A crowd waits outside. Hal and Evelie emerged, married. The crowd cheers and throws rice. Across the street, the merrymakers and Arthur protest. 
Shame! Shame! Behold the bride of backstabbing. Evelie spots them and lowers her head. Exterior, the bucket estate, later. A wedding reception. Evelie and Hal dance. A flower girl twirls with a sparkler in her hand. But the music turns ominous as we track past the couple and happy guests to a huge and bubbling chocolate fountain. The judge, who sentenced Willie, walks over, picks up a strawberry on a stick, <coughs> and dips it in the chocolate fountain. A young boy is doing the same, as is an old grandmother. Beat. And then we move in on the face of the flower girl. She screams in terror. The guests turn to see the judge, the young boy, and the grandmother all foaming at the mouth. The judge falls face first into the chocolate fountain, dead. Exterior London Street, time lapse. Arthur Slugworth buys a paper from the paper boy. Extra, extra, death by chocolate. 27 more poison by bucket bars, death by chocolate. Paper after paper after paper, paper bucket death toll rises to 86. One third of parliament dead in hot cocoa incident. We move in close on Arthur as he reads the final paper. Exterior, the bucket estate gate. For sale signs hung up on the gate. Over the final newspaper headline, disgraced buckets ruined, file for bankruptcy. Exterior prison work camp day. Willie and Felix head in for the day. Willie passes a prison guard reading the same newspaper on Willie as he spots the headline and smiles. Fade out. Interior prison work camp cell months later. A loud clinking of guards yelling, lights out. Sham appears as Willie and Felix's cell. You too. Felix looks to Willie. Uh oh. Report to Sheffy in the mess hall tomorrow. Some dandy prince from India is coming to visit the governor. Prince Pondicherry and the governor requested a feast. Now you two is gonna help him make it. We clear? Yes, sir. Finkel Grubber? There's nothing I'd rather do more, sir. That's the spirit. Cham heads off, and then from far away, the furious howl. Willie then looks to Felix. I think it's high time we moved on to greener pastures, don't you? We're in prison, Willie. Reality, my dear Felix, is always negotiable. Willie looks to Felix and then hits the hay. Exterior jungle, airstrip day. A Royal Indian Airlines plane lands. Exterior jungle road, a Rolls Royce races along the jungle road. Interior governor's mansion, jungle night. A lavish dinner. Governor Foulbody, the protectorate of Loopland, commands the table. He already has gravy on his mustache. Seated next to him amongst the other dignitaries is the young and handsome Prince Pondicherry, 19. Willie and Felix, dressed in tuxedos, serve dinner. Which is why we must do what we can do to, to help the silly races among us. Don't you agree, Prince Pondicherry? Prince Pondicherry nods. Now, let me ask you something, Pondy. M may, may I call you Pondy? Have you read the book, The Rise of the Colored Empires, by this fellow, Goddard? No, sir, I cannot say I have. What's coming, I tell you? Revolution, it's coming. Indeed it is. Now, of course, we're not talking about your people now, like the other colored ones. No offense. Now, regarding the Oompa Loompas. Hard workers, squirrely, but workers. Docile after an arm twist or two. And uh, they can be yours for for Prince, of course. Billy sours. And they have to agree to their relocation? You'd be doing them a favor, Sid Ducks here, little ones, with what the Wang Doodles and the Snozwaggers and the Vermacious Nid. And the Horn Swagglers I've read. Oh, those, those are Smith. Willie and Felix bring over trays of beautiful chocolate truffles. Willie bows and offers one to the prince. Your Highness, the largest one we made especially for you. Prince Pondicherry smiles and takes the largest truffle. Felix and Willie then distribute the rest. 
Now, don't I get a large one too? Yours is equally as special, uh, Your Honor. <laughs> Good. Prince Pondicherry takes a bite of his truffle. Explosions, sparklers. It's a religious experience. This, this is the most, most wonderful piece of chocolate I have ever tasted. How did you? Simply a recipe from a little friend of mine. Governor Foulbody shoves his chocolate in his mouth, as do the other dignitaries. He stands up to toast. The Prince Pondicherry and the start of a most lucrative relationship. Bam! Governor Foulbody foams at the mouth and then keels over dead. Prince Pondicherry looks over to his driver in terror, and the other dignitaries, one by one, drop dead. Willie looks to Felix. Your Highness, it is an assassination. We must go once. This way. Prince Pondicherry and his driver, confused, race out with Willie and Felix. Exterior prison work camp, checkpoint, same. Pouring rain, Willie and Felix and the prince are in his Rolls Royce. They race out of the checkpoint. As soon as they pass, guards race up to the checkpoint after them. But who, who would do such a thing? Oompa Loompas, your highness. Monsters, the whole lot of them. Rolls skids through mud. Why was I spared? It must be your royal blood, your highness. Your greatness made you immune. <laughs> yes, yes, of, of course. Willie rolls his eyes to Felix. Exterior prison work camp, checkpoint, same. Sham pulls up in his Jeep, kneels down in the pouring rain and looks to his Rolls Royce tracks. He turns to the guards. Release her. The guards seem terrified. Interior Rolls Royce, same. The car flies through the rain. We will escort you to your plane. The Oompa Loompas will not let you go without a fight. You two have saved my life. You will come with me to India. Oh, no, your highness. We couldn't. Our life is here on this terrible godforsaken island. The Rolls whips around in a hairpin turn. <sighs> I shall tell you a story. We are being chased, you know. When I was a young boy, I had a dream one night. It was a dream that, that I, was, I was to live in a beautiful palace made of entirely of chocolate. That seems probably a common dream amongst your children. <laughs> you shall build me my palace. A palace made entirely of your incredible chocolate. Have you thought, Your Highness, that perhaps a place made of chocolate may not... And now I shall pay you handsomely. Uh, as my friend was saying, uh, that idea seems a, a grand and fitting gesture for a deity of your stature. We shall do so for the crown. Billy looks to Felix, then they both bow. Exterior jungle island, cage, same. Rain, a wrench turns. The same grate from the opening slides open, then a howl. Interior Rolls Royce, same. Behind them, police sirens. Up ahead, the airstrip. Those are the sirens of the Oompa Loompas. Master. Rolls peels around a turn. Exterior jungle, airstrip, night. The propellers have started and the Rolls stops in front. The pilot opens the door. But we move in on the pilot as he spots something behind the Rolls. He quickly shuts the door. What's he doing? Then the furious Ooh. roar. Willie peers behind him, jungle trees, all falling one by one. What is it? By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Perhaps we should stop quoting Shakespeare and make our way to the play? On Willie is a huge black beast covered in dripping wet fur races toward them. Looks like King Kong met T-Rex. The vermicious mid! The prince, Willie, and Felix race out of the car as a monster bolts toward them. The driver runs the other way. The vermicious canid looks to him. Mmm, day player. <laughs> he bolts, grabs him by his turban, whips him around in his mouth a bit. I thought they weren't real. <laughs> I thought reality was the ghost of Paul. <laughs> Amendment number four, that one related to the vermicious canid. Splat! The driver's head rolls right in front of them. Now run! 
The vermicious canid slams into the side of the Rolls Royce and pushes it through the mud, eventually catching up to the three men. The Rolls is mangled from the vermicious canid's side. Willie looks back. It's teeth. Chomp, chomp. There's a rifle in the trunk. Oh, I got it! Willie hops up, digs into the driver's seat, and grabs the keys. Felix! He tosses Felix the keys, but they go over his head. The vermicious canids turns. Hmm. Felix dives for the keys, but he's too far now as the canid has him cornered. Felix, no! Willie! You go! Just promise me one thing! The canid's teeth are inches away from poor Felix. Felix! Go destroy him! Felix then tosses Willie his watch. It floats through the air until Willie catches it. The vermicious canid chomps down on Felix. Felix, no! But the vermicious canid turns. Time to go. The two race to the plane. The door opens. The pilot and a few others reach down and help the prince up. And then Willie. The plane begins, begins taxiing. The vermicious canid lunges and rip. A tooth tears through his Willie leg through Willie's leg as he hangs off the moving plane. But they pull him up just in time. The door slams shut with Willie and the prince safely inside. The plane takes off, leaving the furious vermicious canid howling in the rain. Interior, Prince Pondicherry's plane, later. The two are exhausted. The prince wraps up a tourniquet around Willie's leg. I, uh, I'm sorry about your driving. And I'm sorry about your friends. Prince Pondicherry nods. Willie looks in his hand. Felix's watch. It's real now. I didn't catch your name. Willie thinks. Wonka. Willie Wonka. And I am at your service. Willie bows to the prince as the plane shoots up into the clouds. Fade out. Exterior, the Chocolate Palace, India, day. Two years later. A huge palace, much like the Taj Mahal, but made entirely of chocolate. Scaffolding is on, on end, and the entire thing is surrounded by an ice dome. Willie, now with cane and a slight limp, instructs hundreds of workers as he walks through with the prince. They both wear heavy purple coats. And over there will be the grand ballroom. A little more detail on the ceiling, mates. And as you see here, we have the entrance to your jewel room and beyond these doors. Willie nods to more workers who open giant chocolate doors. Is the dining room with seating for 1,000 as you requested. All will be ready in time for your birthday. A 1,000 seat dining table made entirely of chocolate. It will be a masterpiece. For a few hours. Now there is one thing we should go over. I do think perhaps, and of course you mm -hmm. are descended from gods, so forgive me if I am out of line, but I do think when we remove the ice dome, as you've instructed on your birthday, perhaps the palace may melt. It melt. Um, well, um, it did not melt when the gods came to me in my dream. Yes. Yes, of course. But perhaps we might think about a more permanent... Uh... It will stand. Mm -hmm. Now go back to the hotel, get some rest. We have much work to do, and I want you in top form, Mr. Willy Wonka. And with that, Prince Pondicherry is off. <clears throat> Exterior Royal Pondicherry Hotel, day. Willie, in sunglasses and a striped bathing suit, sits by a grand pool in a luxurious hotel. Next to him, a beautiful blonde woman reads Vogue magazine. This is Angina Salt, heiress to the salt nut fortune. A pool boy drops off a drink to Willie. Thank you, my good friend. Angina removes her sunglasses. She has a thick southern accent. I am so sorry to interrupt you, but you must be from London. I can tell from your accent. William. William Wonka. Wonka? I don't believe I know the Wonkas. New money. New money. Aren't we all? Of course, my husband's family has all than had all the nut factory for years. I just married into it like a smart girl. 
originally from the States, Charleston, South Carolina. That's down south. But I love living in London. So much more refined. Oh, where are my manners? Angina. Angina Salt. Of the Salt Nut family? You've heard of us. Oh, yes. I've been enjoying your husband's nuts for years. <laughs> No! <laughs> Glad someone has. <laughs> Don't... <laughs> Don't you just absolutely love India? I find the native people truly understand the importance of good service. Now tell me, Mr. Willy Wonka, what line of work allows such a young and handsome man like yourself to luxuriate at this beautiful resort like this? I'm in the chocolate business. Oh, how <laughs> fascinating. I adore chocolate. So you must know the buckets. Willie gets visibly upset. Oh, poor things. After all those people died, it was the lawsuit after lawsuit. They lost everything. Had to put that big estate up for sale, of course. With the way the economy was after the war, no one can afford to buy it. Well, I suppose a man of your mm -hmm, ample means could, but not many others. I think the government plans to auction it. Such a, such a sad thing to lose one's estate. I can think of nothing worse. Truly tragic. Oh, of course. I'm not one to gossip. Last I heard, the whole family moved into a two-room shack. It's, it's so small, four of them even have to share a bed. Oh. Eating cabbage soup every night. Oh, can you imagine? However do they manage? Oh, and then that awful hail. Oh, well, he's just about lost his mind. Can't find any work at all. Spends his time drinking and talking up with married women. Oh, the whole thing's a tragedy. Of course, the one I feel for the most is that sweet thing he married. Oh, what was her name? Evelyn. That's right. It's such a pretty name. So sad to hear that such a wonderful woman has been reduced to nothing. Oh, well, I wouldn't say nothing. Lily perks up. Well, she does have that beautiful son of theirs. Son? Oh, sweet as a lollipop. He must be eight or nine by now. Charlie is his name. As a mother myself, I know as long as you have your children, happiness will find you. Willie furiously stomps his cane. Oh, and speaking of, here's my little angel now. Terrible, horrible blonde girl in pigtails come marching up over. Mm -hmm. Two very upset nannies follow her. This is Veruca Salt, age eight. <gasps> Veruca, Veruca, honey, this is Mr. Willy Wonka. How do you do, Veruca? Mommy, the nutty won't let me bring an elephant back to London. I don't believe elephants belong in London, little girl. This doesn't involve you, twit. Mommy, I want an elephant. I want an elephant now. Angina <sighs> looks to Willy as she gathers up her things. Perhaps I'll see you around, Mr. Wonka. Perhaps. First name, Willy. Willie smiles at Angina, then sneers at Veruca. Of course, you can have an elephant, my little princess. Veruca, Angina, and her nanny exit. We move in on Willie as he downs his drink. Charlie. Inter er, in interior Royal Pondicherry Hotel, bar, night. Willie enters the bar dressed in his finest. Angina is there alone. <gasps> Mr. Wonka! Willie takes a deep breath and heads over. Oh, come, come! Have a drink with me. My husband had to head back on business this afternoon. Oh, so I'm all alone and practically parched with boredom. Two Singapore slings, devil. <laughs> and China smiles. Willie smiles back. Exterior Royal Pondicherry Hotel lobby the next morning. Willie strolls through the lobby, spots the desk boy. My good friend, I shall be checking out in an hour. Please, are ready for me? Yes, Mr. Wonka. 
and make it a large car. <laughs> Two, in fact. I've accumulated quite a bit of your local treasures during my stay. The desk boy nods. Angina, hair a mess and a robe, turns to the lobby. <gasps> after oh, Willie. Willie, when will I see you again? Clearly, they had a great night. Fortunately, we'll have to be in London. In fact, when I get settled in, I'll need your help. Anything. Anything at all. I'd like to help out my dear old friends, the Buckets, if I can. One chocolatier to another. Perhaps when we return to London, you could help me deliver a special gift to them. <gasps> of course. Very well. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Willie heads off to his room, and China is in love. Exterior, the Chocolate Palace, India, day. The sun is blazing hot. The ice dome is gone. A slew of workers line in the front steps line the front steps as guest after fancy guest arrive. Elephants and ribbons are everywhere. It's a beautiful dream. Finally, a Rolls Royce pulls up and Prince Pondicherry emerges. Happy birthday, your highness. Oh, thank you. And has anyone seen Mr. Willy Wonka? He was here earlier, your highness. Hmm. Ah, well, working till the last minute, I see. Well, let the celebration begin. Music blares. Exterior Royal Pondicherry Hotel, same. Hotel workers load the last of several large crates into a light line of large cars. The cars take off. Exterior, the Chocolate Palace, India, later. A grand party inside, but we move in on a, crowd st a carved statue of the prince above the grand door. It slowly begins to melt. Interior, the Chocolate Palace, India, later. The grandest party is in full swing. Prince Pondicherry shows several fancy people around. And of the finest ingredients, secret ingredients. Now, over there is the grand promenade, promenade. And through these doors, here is the jewel room. Inside the jewel room, it's empty. <gasps> what? is the meaning of this. Gods! But as they come rushing over, a single drop of chocolate lands on the prince's cheek. He looks up. The roof begins to collapse. Screams off Prince Pondicherry's face as the building collapses around him and his guests. Interior, private plane, same. Willie takes a bite of an apple as he peers out the window and down over the chocolate palace. It's a river of destruction. Willie gets up talks to the pilot. Captain, I wonder if you wouldn't mind making a slight detour. I have some friends I'd like to bring back to London with me. The captain nods. Exterior plane, same. The plane veers in a different direction. Exterior, the bucket estate, a few months later. Several Oompa Loompas remove the giant B from the gates of the estate and replace them with two Ws. Time lapse. A great smokestack is erected behind the estate. A giant factory appears, larger and larger, added onto the old bucket estate. Smoke emerges from the stacks. A line of trucks leaves the gates. All have the famous Wonka logo. Assembly line, Wonka bar after Wonka bar. Exterior, Willy Wonka's old house later. Willy leans on his new purple Jaguar across the street from his old house. Through the window, his mom and pop sit in their same chairs, now watching television. Better days are coming soon, my dear mom and pop. Better days. Through the window on the mantel is a photo of young Willie, all bright-eyed. It's surrounded by fake flowers and a cross. Willie gets in his car and speeds away. Exterior Wonka Chocolate Shop, formerly HRH Buckets Boutique, day. Workers replace the old HRH Bucket sign with a sparkling new Wonka sign. A long line of children snakes around out front. Willie watches from the inside of his new car. He turns to Nar Narpa in the passenger seat. When lo, as they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide. As if a cavern was suddenly hollowed, the Pied Piper advanced and the children followed. And when all were in to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Narpa looks at Willie, smiles. Soon there will be nothing left of the buckets. Willie stops cold. In line is Evelie. Though in rags and a bit older, she's still as beautiful as ever. Evelie. <clears throat> on Evelie, she leans down and puts a scarf around a young boy, blonde and sweet. This is Charlie Bucket.
and a spot of tea to warm you up. Evelie then reaches in her pocket and pulls out an invisible teapot, pours Charlie some invisible tea. Charlie giggles. On Wonka, his rage is dissipated into just one moment. He can't take his eyes off her. It's like nothing ever happened. Willie drives off intensely. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, night. The WW gates open. A car drives in. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, same. Narpa opens the door. It's Angina, all dressed up in an outfit she's appa she apparently finds sexy. Oh, well, aren't you just the tiniest little thing? I'm here to see Mr. Willy Wonka. I believe he's expecting me. Narpa scowls, then pulls a long cord that leads to an intricate chime system. Oh my, I knew Mr. Wonka was a gentleman of means, but this is truly magnificent. Willie appears at the top of the stairs in an even wilder outfit. Willie! Angina self. Oh. Angina races up and throws her arms around Willie. It's been so long. I thought you would come calling sooner, but I guess you'd have to work, do you? You've had work to do. Now, you said you had a very special gift you wanted me to, to deliver to the buckets. Well, what is it? Oh, do tell. You know, I love a good mystery. Billy pushes her away. Actually, something's come up, Mrs. Salt. Your services are no longer needed. Oh, all right. Very well. Now, I was thinking we could have dinner at this lovely new restaurant I read about that is supposed to be all the rage with... As she prattles on, Willie leans Angina toward the door. I am very busy this evening, Mrs. Salt. I'm sure you understand. But I, I thought we could reconnect. I said thank you. Mrs. Salt. But, but I came all this way. Mrs. Salt, your services are no longer needed. I don't, I just don't understand. Your services are no longer needed. <gasps> I originally requested you to perform a simple delivery for me and that delivery has now been canceled. <laughs> As such, your services are now complete, and therefore, and hitherto, henceforth, no longer needed. I really don't know how much clearer I can be. <laughs> really? What's become of you? Narpa, please escort Mrs. Salt off the premises. Good day, Mrs. Salt. But I love you, Willie. I said good day. <laughs> Five more Oompa Loompas grab Angina and forcefully remove her. Now get off me, you little rats! Willie! Willie! No, I'm sorry! Please, please let me see you again! Angina is gone. Narpa hands Willie the package Angina was to deliver. It's a box of truffles, much like the ones that poisoned Governor Foulbody. In the trash, Narpa. Change of plans, everyone. Change of plans. Let's get a proper night's sleep. We have very little to do and much time to do it in. Willie twirls, Willie twirls his coat and heads back upstairs. Smell that? Love is in the air. Love is in the air. Narpa closes the box of truffles. On the top reads, to the Bucket family, for all you've done, yours truly, Mr. Willie Wonka. He tosses it in the trash. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate Day. Peppy music. Narpa and several other Loompa Loompas, Oompa Loompas roll out what look to be a giant circus animal cages lined with hay. Narpa nods. One by one, the Oompa Loompas unlock the cages. Several golden eggs, each with golden wings, fly off and out into the city. Exterior London Streets Day. The flying golden eggs swoop off in many different directions. We follow the first one to a small shanty. Exterior shanty, shame, same. The golden egg rings the bell and then flutters softly to the ground in front of the door. Arthur Slugworth answers, looks around, then hears a small cracking sound. A tiny chocolate gosling breaks through the golden shell. It has a chocolate invitation in its mouth. It flutters up. Arthur takes it. 
Mr. Willy Wonka requests the pleasure of your company at his first ever quarter yearly biannual semi-monthly Wonka Chocolate Masquerade Ball. Arthur puts down the invitation. Willy Wonka inviting me to a party. Arthur looks to the gosling as it bows and then flies away. Exterior Willy Wonka's old house day. Willy's mom and pop hold the same invitation on their stoop. They seem confused. Exterior psychedelic record store, same. Devin and the rest of the merrymakers read the invitation. Willy Wonka? All right. He smiles at the merrymakers. Exterior terrible neighborhood, same. A lone golden flying egg flutters to the dingy neighborhood. Exterior the bucket shack, moments later. The golden egg swoops around to the front door, then up to the roof where Everly, Everly, Everly <laughs> removes dingy sheets from, a, sheets from a clothesline. The golden egg lands at her feet. She picks up the invitation and reads. Mr. Willy Wonka requests your presence. From behind the wind-whipped sheets, Charlie. You need any help, Mother? Why would Willy Wonka invite me to a party? Willy Wonka? Mother, you must go. Willy Wonka makes the best chocolate in the whole world. That may be true, but we have laundry to finish. Let's go. Yes, Mother. Charlie helps his mother fold the last of the laundry. Interior, the bucket shack, night. Dingy and sad. Lying in the same bed in the center of the room, and are now a much older looking Lord Joe and Lady Josephina Gobsmith and George and Georgina Bucket. Forbid it. Oh, let her go. She's cooped up in here all day, taking care of all these old people. Old? Who are you calling old? You! You, you old bat. Lord Gobsmith. That man stole our family home. Oh, Pibble, you lost it on your own. You should thank him for taking it off your hands. I will not be spoken to in such a way. We are we the pockets! That means a pile of beans these days. Now, Evelie, I say you go and have a good time for once. Charlie enters, hands them each a bowl of cabbage water. Here's your cabbage soup, Grandpa Joe. Thank you, Charlie. You think your mom should go to Willy Wonka's house, don't you, Charlie? I do not approve! Oh, get over it, you old bag! Ah. Stop stealing the covers! You're the one who takes all the covers. My husband does nothing of the kind. The cover stealer is clearly you, Georgina. Well, I never... Charlie clears his throat. <clears throat> I think mom should go. Behind him, Hal enters. He holds an almost empty bottle of whiskey. Go where? Silence. Everyone is afraid of Hal. Charlie? But to, to Mr. Willy Wonka's house, Pop. He, he's having a party. Is that so? Yeah, at his house. Hal plops down in a chair. He's even grosser than before. He turns to Evely. Mr. Willy Wonka invited <clears throat> you to a party. Well, yes, but I don't... Why would Willy Wonka himself invite you to a party? I don't know. Hal takes a final swig of whiskey. Well, looks like me and my beloved wife are going to a party! Evelie looks away, not knowing what to say. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, night. Sparklers shoot out from the gates as a line of cars enter the estate. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, Grand Ballroom, same. A Venice theme. Oompa Loompas dressed in tuxedos hand guests intricate Venetian masks. All are there. Mum and Pop, then Devin and the Merrymakers, then Arthur. Willie, in a somewhat frightening all-white mask, stands at the top of the stairs. He only cares about one guest. Later, the party is in the grandest party in London has seen in a while. Acrobats dangle from the ceiling, fire breathers, peacocks, the works. Arthur watches as a magician levitates an elephant. But it's not possible. Behind him, still wearing his mask, Willie leans in and whispers. 
Reality is whatever we want it to be, Sluggy. Arthur turns, begins to remove his mask. Willie. Keep your mask on and follow me. Willie takes off into the crowd. Arthur follows. Interior library, moments later. Willie shuts the door behind him and locks it. He then removes his mask. Arthur does the same. You're alive. In the flesh. They hug. Willie Baniston. It's walking there. All these years, but how? Long story. But what, well, what matters now is that I'm here and, and it will be like I never left. In fact, you'll come over tomorrow night for one of our old merrymaking sessions. The whole band. Oh, I don't play an instrument anymore. Ridiculous. And I have to work. The toothpaste factory is quite busy now ever since you rolled the town. Then I'll buy the factory tomorrow. Put you in charge so you can have the night off. Oh, Sluggy. It's going to be just like old times. Everything soon will be just like old times. Arthur is like, still nuts. Narpa enters. She is here, sir. We'll continue this conversation later, Sluggy, as a very special guest has arrived. Narpa, see to it that Mr. Arthur Slugworth is set up with anything he needs. Anything at all. Willie puts back on his mask and exits in a hurry. Willie is Willy Wonka. Interior Grand Ballroom, moments later. Evely and Hal enter. Evely is given a beautiful gold and green feathered mask. Hal gets a pig mask. Already ruined the place. I think it's beautiful. You would. I'll be at the bar. Hal takes off to the bar, immediately begins talking to some women. On Wonka, at the top of the stairs, Narpa motions toward Evely. Escort her to the gardens. Narpa nods. Evely is mesmerized by the splendor. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, gardens later. Quite possibly the most romantic garden ever. Evely walks around, taken in by the grandeur. As if out of nowhere, Willie, still in his mask. Oh, sorry, you startled me. I have that effect a lot of, uh, on a lot of women. Is that so? Evely turns. It seems Willie, like a magician, is always right wherever she is. You must be Miss... Uh... Bucket. Evely Bucket. Unfortunately. We sacrifice a lot for marriage. And you are? Wonka. Willie Wonka. Oh. Willie leans in and whispers in her ear. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. Willie then removes his mask. Willie. Evely removes her mask. Evely, as beautiful as the day I first saw you. A flood of emotions washes over Evely. But, but you died, and, and all of this, the house, the factory, and... Evely lowers her head. And? And you must hate me, Willie. Love and hate are but two sides of the same coin. Willie grabs Evely and kisses her. She kisses back for just a moment. It's as if they're back in the park. Come live with me, Evely. I have it all planned out. You'll ask hell for a divorce, and then we shall marry as soon as the ink is dry. The grandest of ceremonies. All the best people, and then a honeymoon. We'll charter the biggest ship on the sea. Spain, Italy, and then Greece. And I've already phoned the best decorators in London. The very best. While we're gone, they'll do up the place any way you like. No expense will be spared for Mrs. Willy Wonka. No expense at all. Evely is speechless. So what do you say? Willie gets down on his knee again. Marry me, Evelyn. Evelyn takes a step back. Willie. All you have to do is say yes. Willie, uh, uh, I can't. But it'll, it'll be just like before, all that unfortunate business. Like, like nothing ever happened. I've forgiven you. I've forgiven all of them. It, it'll all be like it never happened at all. But it did happen. Not if you don't choose to see it that way. That's not how it works, Willie. I'm sorry. I can't. Why? Give me one good reason why you'd rather live in filth with human rubbish like Hal Bucket when you could be here with me. Give me one good reason. My son, Charlie. I must do what's best for him. He needs his father, Willie. But you can both live here with me. Charlie will have a better life. You must see that. Evelie is silent. Evelie! I don't love you, Willie. Willie is crushed. But we just kissed, and, and we were to marry. Years ago. I mean, I was young, and you were a wonderful diversion, but then how came back, and... 
Lily, I honestly don't know if I ever loved you. Stop saying that. But it's the truth. I don't love you, Willy Wonka. Stop saying that! Evelie backs up a bit, scared. Thank you for inviting me to your lovely home. Wait! You, you can change the way you feel! No. No, you can't, Willie. I do it all the time. You can change the truth. You do love me. Evelie, you can and you do. Evelie stops, frustrated. Willie, I have a family now. I have a husband and a beautiful son. And I will not say this again. I do not love you, Willy Wonka. I have never loved you. And I will never, ever, ever love you. Evelie turns and storms out of the garden. On Willie, all of his old fury has returned. The walls of the garden twist and turn into a crippling nightmare. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, same. Evelie flees with Hal. But I was just getting started. They race off past the gates, but we stay in the door where Angina Salt is arguing with some Oompa Loompas. Of course I'm on the list! Mr. Wonka and I have a relationship! If you must know, he is... I'm British all of a sudden, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> very soon to possibly be my fiance. <laughs> the Oompa Loompas drag her out again. Above that, Willie stands in the top window of the estate, looking down as Evelie and Hal exit. He's terrifying. The lights go dark. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, night. The gates are padlocked. Behind that, the first smokestack shuts down, then the other. Exterior Wonka Chocolate Shop, same. The store is boarded up. Charlie walks past, sad. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, bedroom, day. One year later. Willie, now with a full beard and scraggly hair, sits in a grand chair, locked in his room. He's surrounded by old trays of rotting food. In the center of the room are three televisions, all playing different channels at once. One is on an early 60s Dick's, Dick Cavett-style talk show, The Guests Smoke on TV. The TV host interviews a Truman Capote-esque guest psychiatrist. And since the factory shut its doors, the price of Wonka bars have gone through the roof. People are paying $30 a bar in America. Well, I think the old crackpot's a genius. Oh, you do? Oh, $30 for a bar of chocolate? I'd like to be his agent. Canned laughter. But seriously, as a psychiatrist, it's clear Mr. Wonka has become a recluse. He suffers from a grandiose sense of self and, and quite possible narcissist bipolar dissociated, reassociated personality disorder. I mean, stamping on your own name on every bar of chocolate. These are some deep psychological wounds he needs to deal with, which I talk about in my new book. Willy Wonka suffers from a grandiose sense of self and quite possibly narcissistic, bipolar, dissociated, reassociated personality disorder. Available at bookstores everywhere. Willie fumes. Next up, we'll meet the young American girl who's been chewing the same piece of gum for two whole years. On the other TV, a lion rips apart a wild beast. On the third TV, Casablanca. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. Willie watches stone cold, but his eyes dart back and forth so fast it's clear he's losing his mind. Back to the first TV. The host interviews a young American girl, Violet Beauregard. She sits in the chair chewing gum like a cow. Now, the same piece of gum for two whole years. That's certainly an odd hobby. Not as odd as that last freak you talked about. Woo-wee, Willy Wonka sure seems like a weirdo to me. On Willie as he sours. Plus, his gum is terrible. Stick to chocolate, Wonka. Oh, and to my best friend, Miss Cornelia Prince Metal. Look at me, Cornelia. I'm on TV. Willie throws his cane at the TV. It shatters. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, Bendroop, days later. Willie has not moved, although we can understand time has passed because the trays of food are now stacked 15 high. A knock on the door. Narpa enters. You have a visitor, Mr. Wonka. Wonka turns. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, library, later. Arthur Slugworth sits on the sofa, uncomfortably. Willie enters. 
Really? You look like hell. Did they see you come in? Who? Willie looks around, paranoid. The spies. I, I'm not sure I know what... Prognos! Pickle Gruber! They're after my latest invention. They've infiltrated my factory. Willie, are, are you alright? They're all out to get me. Prognos, Pickle Gruber, MI5, the CIA. They're watching me. Willie, you need to get some help. Arthur looks, Arthur looks at Willie, now a por- paranoid shell of a man. Interior Wonka factory, everlasting gobstopper room, later. An elaborate, colorful Rube Goldberg-esque contraption. Narpa is there. I call it the everlasting gobstopper. Willie hits a button. The machine ramps up. It gets louder and louder. Emily Gobsmith. I did everything right. Everything. I worked harder than anyone else. I treated her with the utmost respect. And for that, I suffered more than, a, than can be asked of any man. And yet I still offered her forgiveness. And for what? Nothing. And so I ask you, Sluggy, why bother? Why even bother being a good man? Why be a good man when this is where you end up? So shines a good deed in a weary world. Eventually, an everlasting gobstopper pops out. Arthur reaches for it. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Arthur stops. It's not ready. But when it is, it will be glorious. One piece of candy that lasts forever. Willie turns to Slugworth, serious. I need your help, Slugworth. I'm reopening the factory. I think that's a fine idea, Willie. Get back to work. Take your mind off things. Of course I'll help you. Whatever you need, you've suffered enough. Willie looks at the everlasting gobstopper. Willie leans in and whispers something into Arthur's ear. Now, Narpa, I think I shall take a nice trip down the river. Doesn't that sound lovely, Sluggy? A beautiful boat ride on a lovely afternoon. Arthur is concerned. Interior Wonka factory boat dock, same. Willie sits at the back of his giant pink swan-shaped boat as Narpa navigates down the chocolate river into the tunnel. Images, somewhat psychedelic and terrifying, line the walls of the tunnel. Hard to tell if they're real or in Willie's head. There's no earthly way of knowing which direction they are going. There's no knowing where we're rowing. Or which way the river's flowing. You know Slugworth is right. I have suffered enough. You've suffered enough. We've all suffered enough. I tried with the buckets. Oh, I tried to offer her forgiveness. But still I suffer. Narp appears at Willie. Nods. And I think it's high time we repaid the favor. Let's introduce the only thing she was left to your old... That was the only thing she has left to your old friend. Narpa smiles. Exterior Jungle Island docks, same. Rain, a giant cargo ship, ominous. Exterior cargo ship, same. Three Oompa Loompas hold cattle prods as they pace on top of a giant cargo hold. Then, a furious howl. The Oompa Loompas look at each other, nod, then look at a shackled and tied up. Sham, the awful guy with the scar. The Oompa Loompas motion for him to get into the cargo hold. We can we can work out an arrangement. Zap! The mm. Oompa Loompas nudge him with a prod. I had a job to do. Another jolt. Sham <laughs> enters the cargo hold. A beat. Then a rustle. A scream. Then a thump. Goodbye, awful man. <laughs> Exterior London streets. Day. Charlie walks along the street delivering newspapers. He pops into a... Interior candy shop, same. A group of kids all surround a color TV. Charlie, come look. Charlie hops up on the counter and stares at the TV. On TV, a news anchor speaks. Has announced he's reopening his factory. The kids cheer. Sure, sure. And in celebration, he said four, repeat that, four golden tickets hidden inside Wonka bars all over the world. The lucky kids who find those golden tickets will be invited inside the Wonka factory and be given a lifetime supply of chocolate. The kids scream, then scramble for Wonka bars. Save one for Charlie.
Oh, good. thanks, but I can't afford a Wonka bar. The candy shop owner smiles and hands one to Charlie. Tell me, Charlie. It's on me. Oh, boy. Thank you. Charlie runs out. Exterior London streets, moments later. Charlie holds his breath and opens the Wonka bar. Nothing. He shrugs and then heads home. Exterior London streets, same. Newspaper after newspaper, the world is a buzz over Wonka's golden tickets. Interior salt that factory, day. A glass office overlooks a factory floor. Hundreds of workers unwrap cases of Wonka bars. They must find one for my Veruca. She's allowed to bring gu a guardian. They must find one now! A lump of a man, Herbert Salt, looks on. They're trying their hardest, my dear boys. Veruca must get in to Wonka's factory. She simply must see him. But Veruca says she doesn't even want a golden ticket. I don't want a stupid golden ticket, mummy. I want a giraffe. You will want a golden ticket and you will want it now. Have I made myself clear, Veruca? Yes. Find that golden ticket now. Workers work faster. Exterior Wonka factory night. A massive 18 wheeler shrouded in thick military canvas enters the gates. 10 Oompa Loompas all with cattle prods await its rival. Interior Wonka factory, chocolate river, same. Willie stands atop a giant chocolate waterfall as an army of Oompa Loompas work furiously. <laughs> Quality first, my little friends. Quality, then speed. Quality, speed, then fresh eggs. No, wait, that's not right. Speed, then eggs, then quality. And then a dash of patience with a side of la-di-da. Chocolate churns. Narpa approaches Willie, whispers. Oh, or, or rather large guest has arrived. Uh, he must be terribly hungry. Will you tell him never fear, never fear for supper is almost here? Willie grins. Interior Gloop Clockmakers, Germany, same. Reporters scramble to get an interview with a huge man and woman, Augustus and Mrs. Gloop Sr., while their obese 10 year old son, Augustus Gloop, chews on a slab of fudge. I mean, tell our reporters how happy you are to have the golden ticket, Augustus. <laughs> Mrs. Gloop slaps him on the back of the head. Amidst the hubbub, Arthur Slugworth, wearing all black, is in the background. He exits, twirling a cuckoo clock on his way out. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, bedroom, same. Willie watches a scene on TV. He looks to the watch Felix gave him, smiles. Exterior Beauregard, Beauregard Auto Mall, Montana, USA, day. A crush of reporters interviewed the gum-chewing Violet. Hey, if that freak wants to give me a bunch of free chocolate, more power to him. Violet smacks away in her gum. In the background, Slugworth. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate. Bedroom, same. Willie watches. Oh, nothing's free, my dear Violet. Interior Mike TV's house, Arizona, same. A young man, Mike TV, watches TV while being interviewed by reporters. He seems like a dick. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate. Bedroom. Wonka perks up as he watches. Who is this? Narpa looks down at his list. Mike TV, sir. It's supposed to be Mike Teethy of Brixton. His horrible father owns the toothpaste factory. Oh, well, this one looks like he has it coming too. Just little Charlie left. Wonka hops up. Now let's check on those new nutcrackers I purchased. Narpa begins to follow Willie until, on TV, a special bulletin. Wonka stops. Exterior salt nut factory, same. Reporters swarm the factory. We're here out in front of the world famous Salt Nut Factory where the fourth and final ticket has been found by the young girl, Ms. Veruca Salt. The reporter thrusts the microphone in Veruca's face, but Angina grabs it, waving the golden ticket. Veruca is plum pickled with positivity. We are going to have just the most wonderful time visiting Mr. Willy Wonka's factory. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate. Bedroom, same. Willie slams his cane down. You know, Mr. Wonka is a dear, dear friend of mine, and it will be wonderful to 
reconnect. Willie clicks off the TV. That ticket was meant for Charlie. Wonka storms out of the room. Interior, the bucket shack, same. Charlie enters, sullen. What's wrong, Charlie? No, they found the last ticket. Good, you have no business cavorting with the thief like Mr. Wonka. Be quiet, you old hag. Ah! Come here. Charlie leans on Grandpa Joe's shoulder. Never you mind the naysayers. Your day will come. But I saw it on the news. There's no more tickets left. So you don't get a golden ticket. You'll get other golden tickets. I, I don't understand, Grandpa. It's a metaphor, Charlie. Your golden ticket is out there. You just have to keep your eyes open so when it comes along, you can see it. Oh, stop feeding the poor child riddles! Let me tell you a secret, Charlie. Reality is whenever we want it to, whatever we want it to be. A little imagination goes a long way. Charlie smiles. Never forget that. Just look at what it's done for Mr. Wonka. Evelie, furious, slams in a pot of cabbage soup. Enough! Everyone looks at her, stunned. Exterior London streets the next day. Charlie, forlorn, walks past the same candy shop. He looks in, walks past. Behind him, Slugworth enters. Later, dusk, Charlie walks home, past the same shop. Another crowd of children are inside. Ch Charlie looks at his pockets, pulls out a coin. Interior candy shop, same. Charlie walks in confused as all the kids are clamoring for Wonka bars. Didn't you hear, Charlie? Wonka said there are actually five golden tickets. There's one ticket left. Charlie smiles, puts his coin on the counter. Grandpa was right. One Wonka bar, please. The candy shop owner looks around, then grabs a bar from under the counter. Why don't you try this one, Charlie? He winks at Charlie. Charlie takes a deep breath closes his eyes, rips open the package. A golden ticket! Charlie is elated. I won! I got a golden ticket! Yeah, you did, Charlie. Charlie, Charlie takes off. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, the big day. A crush of reporters lines the gates. In just an hour, the five lucky children will enter through these once locked gates. Above, in the same distant window, Willy Wonka. And then, just like that, he's gone. Interior salt nut factory, glass office, same. Angina is tied to a chair. Herbert stands before her, holding a box of letters. He throws them at her. Veruca is behind her father, loving every minute of it. An affair? An affair with Mr. Willy Wonka? <clears throat> Herbert, it was nothing. I'll make it up to you as soon as Veruca and I... Oh, you'll make it up to me, all right. You'll see. He'll see. Veruca. Veruca approaches her mother, rips off a piece of duct tape. Oh, Veruca. Veruca, no, I am your mother. Veruca, don't you want mommy to take you to Mr. Wonka's? Veruca duct tapes Angina's mouth shut. Finally, she shut up for once. All right, Veruca, off to the car. Daddy is going to pay Mr. Wonka a visit. Herbert and Veruca exit as Angina, bound and gagged, struggles for help. Interior Wonka factory, cocoa bean tank, same. Willie stands on a catwalk overlooking a giant tank filled with cocoa beans. He walks to the next giant tank. It's, inside this one is the vermicious canid shackled to a wall. Not much longer, my hungry little beast. Not much longer. Today I ordered in. The vermicious canid bounds up furious toward the catwalk, but the shackles snag it. Still, it's more terrifying than ever. Interior, the bucket estate, same. Evely enters with a basket of laundry. She looks around. Where's Charlie? Where's dad? Well, they've gone to the Wonkas, of course. What? What do you mean? I told you we should have told her. She told you, you should have told her. Told me what? Well? Charlie found the golden ticket, of course. Oh my god. Evelie races out. Exterior, the bucket shack, same. Evelie races down the street. She's terrified. 
Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, foyer, same. Willie puts on his purple coat and top hat. He's flanked by Slugworth, Slugworth and Narpa. Gentlemen. Willie, what's this all for? Is it just to sell more chocolate? Because there are better ways. You'll see, Sluggy. Willie opens the door. Flash bulbs erupt. My public awaits. Willie exits. Interior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate. Coat check room later. Willie shuffle, shuffles the winners inside after meeting them. First, Augustus Gloop and his mother. Oh, Augustus. Augustus Gloop. Augustus stops. Willie whispers to him and his mother. I never did get a chance to ask. Exactly how old are you, young man? Today is his 10th birthday. At what time exactly were you born 10, ten years ago, Augustus? He was born at 11 in the morning. Does that mean he won already? No. It means we haven't a moment to waste. Next, Violet Beauregard and, and her father, Mr. Beauregard. Hello, Violet. Willie literally shoves her away. She looks at him and scowls. Next, Mike TV. You were a mistake. You never <laughs> Willie shoves him off a few Oompa Loompas. Herbert Salt approaches, with, approaches Willie, leans in. I know you've been getting on with my wife. And I hated every minute of it. You, sir, are a hero to men the world over for taking that woman off our hands. <laughs> All right, move along. The Oompa Loompas drag the salts inside. And finally, Charlie Bucket and Grandpa Joe. Big day for you, Charlie. Oh, I can't wait, Mr. Wonka. Willie puts a shh finger up to his mouth. Charlie, do you know what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he ever wanted? What happened? He finally lived happily ever after. Now let's move along. Grandpa Joe and Charlie follow Willie. I think he means you, Charlie. You're the man who's going to get everything he ever wanted. Willie shuffles Charlie and Grandpa Joe through a door. Pauses. <laughs> oh, how very wrong you are, Lord Gobsmith. How very wrong you are. Willie then kicks up his heels and heads through the door. Interior Wonka Factory, candy room, same. Candy growing everywhere, the chocolate river and waterfall in the distance. The kids and adults are preoccupied with all the wonders. Everything is eatable. Take whatever you like. Willie finds Augustus. Ah, Augustus, if I may have a word. Do you know what this is, Augustus? Willie shows him Felix's watch. Leave me alone, I'm busy. This is the watch of a very close friend of mine. He once worked for your father. Augustus catches a chocolate frog, eats it. Well, your father was not very nice to my friend and did something very terrible to him. Augustus spots a chocolate river. Oh, look, a river of chocolate. He kneels down to drink from it. Wonka comes up behind him, whispers in his ear. Your father, Augustus, sent him away even though he had done nothing wrong. And do you know when all this happened, my Augustus? Exactly ten years ago today. Willie, with the tap of his foot, knocks Augustus into the chocolate river. Help! Mrs. Gloop races over. Augustus, help him! All bad apples deserve to die. Time to go. Chop, chop, everyone, this way. Everyone follows Willie, a bit scared now. From the top of the waterfall, Slugworth watches. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, gates, same. Everyone is gone, the gates are locked. Evelie races up. Charlie! She grabs the iron gates and tries to pry them open. Nothing. She tries again, still nothing. Then, a distant howl. Interior, Wonka Factory, Everlasting Gobstopper Room, same. Willie explains the Everlasting Gobstopper to the remaining kids and parents. Violet pokes around a gum maker. Last forever. You only need to buy one. That way, no matter how much money you have, when it comes to an everlasting gobstopper, we're all equal. Sounds like socialism to me. But I thought you liked sharing. Willie spots Violet putting a piece of gum into her mouth. Oh, oh and I wouldn't eat that if I were you. Why doesn't she listen to Mr. Wonka? Willie hears this, makes him even more upset that Charlie's sweet. Move along. They make their way to a hallway, leaving Violet. Hallway. What's a gobstopper? 
Dobbs gobs, obviously. Now moving on here. Over here. Come on. Mr. Beauregard comes running into the hallway. Walk away. It's Violet. She's blue. Who? Yeah, it's blue. No, I said who? Violet, my daughter. She's blue. Hmm. I don't seem to recall a Violet. But we just, uh... You should have your head examined. You may have bumped in, uh, into the way in. Uh, Oompa Loompas. Willie and the rest are gone. A swarm of Oompa Loompas walk past and a group back into a previous room to roll Violet away. Wait! My daughter! Wonka is gone. Interior Wonka factory, boat dock later. Wonka helps everyone into the swan boat. Slugworth is there. Willie, can I speak with you? As you can see, I'm a bit preoccupied at the moment. Arthur grabs Willie and drags him onto the optical hallway. Arthur shuts the door behind Willie. What are you doing? What am I doing? What are any of us ever doing, Sluggy? Can anyone really say what we're ever doing? Just standing on a rock in the middle of space that's spinning at a rate of 108,000 kilometers per hour? That's what I'm doing, Sluggy. The children, Willie, what are you doing? The, the fat one is probably drowned and now the gum chewer is turned into some sort of sick medical experiment. She's simply a blueberry. Willie, they're just children. Willie becomes agitated. Just children? Just awful children. Just awful children who, gr who will grow up to become awful adults who will then unleash all manners of pains and ills upon the rest of us. I'm doing the world a favor by extinguishing them now. Extinguishing? Willie, you're mad. All questions regarding my sanity must be submitted in writing to the pr proprietors of said crime. What are you talking about? The Buckets. George and Georgina Bucket, their son Hal Bucket, Lord and Lady Gobsmith, who married off their daughter. Perhaps you remember her. Evely Gobsmith, now called Evely Bucket. Well, I thought I destroyed them. But I was wrong, and so finally, and without further ado, we shall bid adieu to Charlie Bucket. Now, good day, Mr. Slugwood. You've become a bitter, vile man, William Baniston. Never call me that. Look at yourself. You're no better than Hal. No better than Hal at all. This seems to get Willie, if only for a second. They did this to me. The Willie I once knew used to see things any way he pleased. I guess he pleased to see himself a victim of a common drunkard and his fickle wife. Narpa! Narpa enters. Escort Arthur Slugworth off the property. Good day, good day. Several Oompa Loompas enter and drag Arthur out. I used to look up to you, Willie. I said good day. Willie storms out. Interior Wonka factory, boat dock, same. Willie enters, fluffs his coat. It's just so hard to find good help these days. Isn't that right, Veruca? That's the first smart thing you've said all day. Oh, I'm sorry, Veruca. All words must be spoken upside down and then flipped a right side up ways from now on. Now, where are we? Ah, yes, everyone into the boat. Willie hops up front. The boat begins moving down its psychedelic tunnel, terror tunnel. Onward, Christian soldiers. Mad. Willie peers to the boat's rearview mirror, studies Charlie's response. I like him. Willie sours. This kid will do no wrong. Exterior Wonka Estate, formerly the Bucket Estate, same. Arthur runs, runs along the walls of the estate. He spots Evely trying in vain to scale the wall. Evely. She stops. I know we've had our differences in the past, but we must do away with all that now. Charlie is in great danger. Another howl. I know. And I know a way in. They both begin running. Interior Wonka factory, nut room, later. Music starts up. Willie is maniacally dancing and twirling all around a large room filled with giant squirrels. They crack nuts. The nuts drop down the on a lawyer scale. Good nut or bad nut? As the music swells, Willie whispers something into Veruca's ear and with an elegant tap of his cane, knocks her down into the bad nut chute. Her father dives in after her. Willie twirls to the music, stops at Charlie. We're getting close, Charlie Bucket. Very close. Charlie smiles. 
he shouldn't. Interior Wonka factory, TV room, later. Same music. Mike TV steps on a platform underneath what looks like a giant laser. Willie casually leans on a red button. Mike disappears, just a million tiny particles floating above Willie like space dust. It's almost beautiful. Slow motion as Willie conducts the space dust like dancers in a ballet. He's so far gone, yet so joyous. We can't hear because of the music, but Mrs. TV is truly freaking out at the size of her newly shrunken son. Willie pays her no mind as the Oompa Loompas escort them away. Interior Wonka factory, wallpaper hallway, moments later. Willie walks behind Charlie and Grandpa Joe. Four terrible children gone, one good little boy left. Now just through this door is the cocoa bean room. Would you like to see the cocoa bean room, Charlie? Charlie stops. Well, Mr. Wonka, I would, but first, will they be okay? Will who be okay? The other kids. What other kids? Augustus and Violet and Baruka and Mike. Hmm. Names are not ringing a bell. Well, Augustus was the kid who knew so much about your chocolate. Uh, you, you were his hero, Mr. Wonky. He said he wanted to be just like you when he grew up. He did. I mean, we, we must keep moving. The bean room awaits. Well, yeah. I mean... Because I guess his father was a real jerk. Augustus even tried to recreate some of your recipes, but he said you were too much of a genius to be copied. Willie Sowers, this shall not affect me. And Violet, she turned into a blueberry? You must remember her. She was the friendly one. Just as friendly as anyone I've ever met. Could talk to anyone. I wish I could do that. I'd probably have more friends if I could. The blueberry, Wonka. Just moments ago, you must remember. Here, bell. No bell? Therefore, no bell is ringing. Therefore, no bell has rung. Come now, we must beat on. Boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past, and so on and so forth, etc., etc. Sick transit, Gloria, blah da But will they be okay? Veruca, too. Veruca. You mean to tell me someone named after a common and highly inappropriate wart was in my factory? She was the really pretty girl. She oh, she knew exactly what she wanted. Sometimes I wish I could make up my mind like her. And she offered to give me her old giraffe while we were on the boat. I never met a girl so nice. Willie can barely stand Charlie's kindness anymore. And Mike TV? Wow. I mean, the American, American kids are so cool. See, he told me all... Enough! Willie reaches the end of the hallway. Enough! Wonka opens the door to the cocoa bean room, Charlie's final resting ground. Exterior Wonka estate, formerly the Bucket estate, same. Evely and Arthur spot a small grate in the wall that surrounds Wonka's estate. They use these tunnels during the air raids. She reaches down and rips off the metal grate. Well, then. Follow me. Evely and Arthur duck inside. Interior Wonka factory, cocoa bean room, same. Willie walks along the catwalk, thrilled. Well, we've reached the end of the line. The end? What about Charlie? What about his lifetime supply of chocolate? Willie twirls around. He won't need it. But he's the last kid left. It's okay, Grandpa. I don't mind. What am I going to do with chocolate for life? A howl, and Willie rears his head at Charlie. Will you stop? Hey, he's just a child. I like him. I wish I could make friends like her. No one's ever been so nice to me. She said I could have her old giraffe. Blah, blah, blah. I'm little Mr. Perfect. Willie moves closer to the edge of the next cocoa bean tank. Grandpa Joe puts his arm around Charlie's shoulders. You are vile, just like the rest of them. Admit it. I don't understand, Mr. Wonka. <laughs> oh, I get it now. This is your r- ruse. Well, well played, Charlie. Well played, but I'm on to you. No one as sickly sweet as you could spring forth from bucket blood. Willie puts his hand on Charlie's head, which grips the railing of the catwalk. Interior Wonka factory, juicing room, same. Evely and Arthur race past Violet, basically back to normal, but still blue. Hurry. Another howl. They keep running. Interior Wonka factory, cocoa bean room, same. 
Willie is in a fury. His prize is close. Come on, Charlie. Let's get out of here. This man is a crook. Willie blocks him on the catwalk. Am I? Am I, Charlie? Is your grandfather right? Am I a crook? Say it, Charlie. Say I'm a monster. Say what you're really thinking for once. Come on, Charlie. Show me your anger. Show me your hatred. Show me your true, disgusting, vile nature. Tell me what I truly am. Charlie is terrified. Just then, the vermicious Kinnick bounce up, still shackled. What is that? Willie smiles. Interior Wonka factory, incinerator room, same. Veruca and Herbert, bandaged, sit on gurneys. Evelie and Arthur race by. Herbert, in a daze, points to a long hallway. Arthur and Evelie race out. Interior Wonka factory, cocoa bean room, same. Wonka is in a murderous wreck. Grandpa Joe looks around for a way out. I said, tell me what you really think of me, Charlie. I think you're Willy Wonka. You're the greatest man who's ever lived. I think you spent your whole life making children all over the world happy day in and day out. Who else can say that? Willy is fighting Charlie's truth. And I think sometimes someone is so good and so pure that maybe it's, it's hard for them to relate to anyone else because most people aren't like that. But you are. And I hope you stay that way forever because most people out there may be sad and angry and drab, but you don't let any of that get to you. I mean, you're, you're Willy Wonka. Willy turns. He's begun to cry. <laughs> you're one of the few people around who knows that reality is whatever you want it to be. Willy stops. What did you say? Grandpa is ready to attack. Reality is whatever you want it to be. My Grandpa Joe taught me that, didn't you, Grandpa? On Willy. He's changed in an instant. He's silent. Let's get out of here, Charlie. But the vermicious Knid leaps again. He shakes the catwalk. Charlie topples, but catches the catwalk just in time. On Slugworth and Evelie, as they enter, Charlie dangles over the beast. But then, just in time, Willie reaches down and saves Charlie from the now leaping Knid. He hugs little Charlie, kneels down, wipes his tears. Evelie and Slugworth stop as Wonka embraces Charlie. Interior, Wonka Chocolate Shop, Willie's office later. Willie is all smiles. It's yours, Charlie. What's his? This? All of this? Wonka Chocolate Factory. I'm giving it to you. It's all yours. I don't understand. You know, it, it was always supposed to be yours anyway, Charlie. What, one day this would have been yours had I not come along. But now, I don't need it. But you're Willie Wonka. I'm free now, Charlie. I'm free. Willie backs up, slides up a wall of books to reveal a great glass elevator. He opens it and steps inside. Take good care of it, Charlie. He's really serious. Willie tosses Charlie a set of keys. Thank you, Mr. Wonka. I, I won't let you down. Wonka presses a button on the glass elevator. It ramps up. He looks to Evelie. Evelie. You are a truly remarkable mother. The best there is. And Sluggy, my good man Sluggy, I trust you'll stay here and be Charlie's right-hand man. The elevator is getting louder. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye. Willie looks to Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. But I didn't do anything, Mr. Wonka. Oh, but you did, Charlie. You did. I'm free, Charlie. The elevator shakes furiously, and with that, Mr. Willy Wonka shoots up into the sky in his glass elevator. On Wonka. I'm free. The end. <laughs> and that was oh. the untold tale of Willy Wonka. We'll Ugh. see you to the next one. <laughs>